We must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support. And now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Field, and tonight we have on a very special guest, longtime supporter of the show, but first time guest, the lovely and talented Dr. Becky Bliss. We're going to discuss a very important topic for those interested in pursuing a terminal degree. Tonight, we discuss the Mount Olympus that is the dissertation process. Having just recently completed my educational doctorate, or EDD, that whole dissertation process, and with Becky recently completing her Doctor of Health Science, or DHSC, we figured it'd be good to talk about the process of the dissertation from start to finish. For some of those considering maybe an EDD or a DSC or a PhD, Becky, first off, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and for all of your support in the past. Could you start off by telling our audience a little bit about your academic journey and how it led you to where you are today? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, after 15 years of clinical practice, I made the leap into higher education. Because of the need for a change, I was working as a clinic manager in an outpatient clinic and the focus on metrics and revenues and visits per eval and, you know, revenue per visit didn't lead to very much satisfaction at the end of the day. I was running metrics in the evenings after I went home and I had lost sight a little bit of why I originally started my journey as a physical therapist. So my love and what excited me was teaching students that I took regularly. So I went from a one student in the clinic um, environment to 40 plus in the classroom. And I truly feel like I am able to make a small difference for the future of the PT practice. Yeah, that's awesome. I wish I could say that I knew what I wanted to do with my EDD and and which direction I was heading, but uh, I haven't quite figured that out yet. So tell me a little bit about what led you to pursue your DHSC. So six months after starting as a full-time faculty, um, CAPTI's requirements changed, and that's when they instilled that they were going to start enforcing the 50% terminal academic degree. And program chair got announced it at a faculty meeting, and everyone kind of looked around knowing that we weren't in compliance. <laughs> and who was going to jump, jump aboard and start a program? Um, so I started investigating terminal degree programs. Um, my main focus was searching for one that would give me skills to be a better educator. I knew I was a great clinician. And I taught really great clinical skills, but I didn't have that foundational knowledge in the science of teaching and learning. And so I went about it. It took me about a year to go through. I can't tell you how many phone calls I had with programs, PhD programs. I even had an interview um, with a PhD program. And then in talking to the EDDs as well as the DSCs or the DHSCs. And ultimately, it came down to the best fit for what I was looking for. And the program that I ultimately chose was really great. It focused 50% on science of teaching and learning and 50% on scientific inquiry. So both of the areas that I really felt like I needed continued mentorship in with a leadership thread throughout. So I thought thought it was the best of all worlds in that respect. You know, I I wish, again, I I wish I had some sort of direction as far as uh, how I stumbled into my program, my EDD. I uh, just kind of, I was at St. Augustine doing the transitional doctorate. Uh, The head of the EDD asked me if I wanted to teach at some point. And I said, not really. Um, But, you know, it was, it was a matter of, well, you know, hey, some of these classes overlap. So you could cut a four-year program down to a three-year program. And, you know, went back and talked to my wife about it and kind of figured that, well, you know, if things really fall apart and, uh, you know, my back gives out or my knees go out, my hands give out and I just can't do the clinical stuff anymore and I can't do manual therapy, I could always fall back on teaching. 
and for me, I think, you know, the, the EDD made a little bit of sense because I did enjoy education and I did enjoy learning and the process of learning and, you know, the science behind teaching and a lot of the theory that goes into it. So, uh, you know, I figured worst case scenario, I could always teach education. It didn't have to be physical therapy related. And I think that's where I kind of landed on the, the EDD. But uh, it's interesting that you and I are both here talking about the dissertation process and, and neither one of us is a PhD, which, which I love. Um, but I, I do have a kind of a personal selfish question here, but do you get a sense or a feeling that uh, DHSCs or EDDs or, you know, DSCs are looked at any differently than PhDs? Um, I think it depends. It's that, that answer that we give our students that they absolutely hate, right? It depends on things. But um, I luckily had an amazing mentor. She was actually my own PT school faculty advisor. And as I was going through the process, I'm like, who can I ask about this? Because I really was weighing, like, I was feeling pressure that the PhD was a better degree. And why would I go any less than that? And, you know, not really knowing, but not really feeling like the PhD was the right fit for me because it was going to give me great research skills. And I was going to be an expert in one area of research, or the ones that I was looking at at least. Um, and it wasn't an educational PhD. It wasn't in curriculum design. It wasn't in, you know, assessment, those types of things. Um, and so I called, I actually cold emailed her a little bit and said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but 20 years later and said, this is the decision I am. I'm in academics um, and I just don't know what is the best decision. And I really feel the pressure to do a PhD. And she gave me such good sound advice, which make me, helped me make my final decision. And that was, where do you see yourself teaching? Do you want to teach at an R1 institution and go after, you know, NIH grants or grant funding? Or, you know, do you see yourself at a smaller teaching and learning institution where you're still doing research, but maybe not as much on a, on a grand scale? And at that time, I was at a smaller teaching and learning institution and I couldn't see going anywhere different. So at that time, it was perfect for me to, to think about the DHSC rather than that PhD. The other thing was the closest PhD program to me in Kansas City at that time was not taking any part-time students. So it was, if it was a commitment, it was quitting my job and going PhD full-time. And at that point in time, financially, our family could not you know, sustain that. So that, that helped make that decision as well. Yeah, that's a really great breakdown and, and, and good thought process behind all that. I, I like how you kind of broke that down and went through that. So catch us up a little bit. You get into a program, right? You're in this terminal degree program. You've decided which one is best for you. Uh, you go through the program. Well, catch us up to speed a little bit. What makes you eligible to even begin the dissertation process now? Um, the great thing about my program um, was that from day one, it was laid out exactly what the expectations were, and we were cohort style. So it wasn't a program where you got to pick your classes and kind of piecemeal things together on your timeline. It was cohorts. You can do the three and a half year program accelerated, or you can do the five year program. And so everything was really well laid out. So I knew exactly what courses I had to take in which semesters in order to be eligible for that dissertation process. Um, and so once towards the final semesters of all my required coursework, I had to enroll in a doctoral proposal. So you had to successfully pass research methodology, research design, quantitative, qualitative, you know, statistics, and then really know that you had a good idea. And then at that point in time, you're allowed to enroll into a doctoral proposal course, which was required, and you spend all semester writing the first three chapters of a five-chapter dissertation product. Um, at the end of the course, so you have to have your committee members identified, um, go back and forth with each chapter. So you write your chapter, as you know, through this process and then send off your draft of your chapter, you know, wait for some edit suggestions, start the next one and go through that process for chapters one, two, and three. And they'd like you to do them separately to make sure everything kind of falls together. And then once all that is secure and your committee feels like you're ready to do your proposal, um, it could be at the end of that semester or they actually have a built-in one credit research application for those who weren't quite ready yet to carry it over to the next semester if needed. I was able to defend in that semester successfully and so then you get approval to defend your dissertation proposal. And so then you defend what you're getting ready to deploy essentially in your research endeavors. And then once that is approved then you submit for your IRB. 
So all everything had to be sound before they even let you think about submitting for the IRB to make sure it wasn't going to go bouncing back and forth. Um, which is, in hindsight, it was great. It was a little bit stressful for me because I had my defense proposal in early December, and I knew I was going to data collect start of January um, because I did educational research. Knowing that there's that Christmas break and the IRB takes a break, I was really on a crunch timeline for my IRB submission, and thankfully, um, people were able to work with me, and I let them know it was coming and kind of vetted the process a little bit so I knew that everything was streamlined. Yeah, I kind of got stuck in that IRB ping pong a little bit there. Um, my program started out uh, in one direction. Did you have to take like an oral qualification exam before you even uh, started? Your I did not. That was something different about my program um, that I did not have to do that. So I felt very lucky about yeah. that. Um, so. so we had to take an oral qualification exam to show that we were competent for everything we learned prior to starting the dissertation. Then we were able to start the dissertation. It was broken up into semester one was dissertation one, semester two was dissertation two, uh, three and four and so on. Well, the problem is after I had started dissertation one, after passing my oral qual qualification exam, uh, the head of the program switched and the new program brought in the cohort method. And so we were kind of shimmied into that cohort program. And I actually had to repeat semester dissertation one or whatever, because I, I ended up just taking the semester off due to some family issues. So I went back and I really basically started all over again with that cohort system uh, after that. And then, uh, yeah, four, four semesters later. And uh, but my first IRB proposal just got flat out denied. It was like, yeah, no, we're not going to do this. Um, and it was, it was interesting because it was using service-based learning the way that I ended up doing uh, my dissertation on. But uh, I wanted to actually go out in the community and perform uh, like a balance test and teach a uh, Berg balance test and, um, you know, timed up and go you know, some, as a balance screen for like a community an elderly community as a community service project, and then compare it to maybe the same tests, but taught in the classroom. And uh, they just weren't comfortable with, with it. And so I shut that down and I just went to a survey study instead. Um, and that's what I eventually ended up doing. But yeah, the IRB process, um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it was definitely a, a hectic one for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then you sub you hit submit and then you're like, okay, how long are they going to take it to get back? How many edits am I going to have? What suggestions and things like that? And I also did survey-based research and did an online call it the Qualtrics, so the online um, survey instrument yeah. platform. And it was interesting because I had done multiple surveys prior to that in my faculty role. But for this IRB, they, in order to truly make this survey anonymous, which I had not thought about or nobody had actually proposed this, I actually had to disengage and make sure that I turned off the feature of capturing anybody's IP address, even though, you know, because they saw that as potential being yeah. non-anonymous. So, you know, little things like that, that just you learn along the process. And I yeah. never would have thought of that because nobody, you know, in my own institution had actually required that previously. For sure. So tell us a little bit about what goes into the idea formation process as far as like the initial stages of a dis dissertation, trying to come up with your research project. H how did you go about doing all that? I kind of wandered. So, you know, where do I start? Um, from the beginning of the program, when they introduced the doctoral project, because we had to actually, my program was hybrid. And so we were required to do once a semester, once a year on in-person, face-to-face, just to kind of like make sure we were meeting people and looking at our potential committee chairs from the institution, things like that, and just going over some of the topics. So from the original get-go, when they were introducing the pro project, knowing that we would have to do this at the end of the three years, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna do concussion, some type of concussion research. Um, you know, I'll you know, look at validity and reliability of an outcome measure that's commonly used that maybe doesn't have good psychometrics yet in that population. We know that that's lacking or, you know, early intervention. That's one of my big things that I do as well. And then um, the more we got into the process and the more we got into the research applications and what goes into doing really good sound scientific research and looking at my location in the country, which was in very rural, um, about 40 minutes outside of Charlotte at a very small teaching and learning institution. 
Um, and seeing that with my capstone mentorship that I had with my entry level students and the problems with recruitment of individuals um, and hearing horror stories about people being stuck in the, the hamster wheel trying to get their final subjects so that they could get enough subjects. I kind of had a little bit of, I don't know if I really want to do this. Maybe I should switch. And it was actually at CSM of 2018. Um, I was one of the, in one of the educational sessions of the Academy of PT Education. And it was, um, you know, Creighton's group and, and Fruz is from Creighton. And they were talking about, and then there was instructors from Colorado, and they were talking about how they were utilizing their rubric for clinical reasoning that they had developed. And so they would have the lab practical happen. They were showing videos. And right after the lab practical, they asked the students, so how do you think it went? Tell me about these, these things using their, their clinical reasoning rubric. Um, and it was very interesting because the students stumbled and said, well, I think it went great because they thought they passed, right? So they were like, great, if I passed, that's all that matters at that point. And so this goes on and they presented and I was like, wow, this is really, you know, good stuff. And at the end of the session, when the presenters take questions, a student stood up and got to the mic and said, all of this is great and I can see why you're trying this and asking students to reflect on their own performances. But I can honestly say, no one has ever told, taught me or told me what goes into good reflection. And it was this big aha moment to me that was like, oh my gosh, the student is saying, you have me reflecting all throughout school, but no one's ever taught me how to reflect and it hasn't been intentionally designed. And so he even said, I think that's probably the problem that you're having with today's learners is that we never were taught. We were always told we did a good job and oh great you did a great job um but not saying like how would you do it differently or what could you have done better and so absolutely huge to me so i left there saying i think this is the topic that i really want well and ironically <laughs> enough <laughs> reflection is one of the things that separates experts from novices especially yes. in the pt field yes. so so yeah i mean you hit the nail on the head there so i started like i went back and then started looking at what devices or tools or outcome measures are out there so that we could measure the ability to self-reflect change in DPT students? What's been done before? Am I, you know, coming up with something novel or is this something that, you know, has already been done and I'm just spinning my wheels? And so in looking, there really wasn't any validated measure that looked at change based on educational pedagogies or methodologies. And so I came across a scale um, that was called the Self-Reflection and Insight Scale, and it was developed by Dr. Anthony Grant in Australia. He's at the University of Sydney, and I was like, well, I might as well look him up and see if I can use it. So I literally looked his email address, and I was like, hey, Dr. Grant, I'm a physical therapist, and, you know, went into all of this. I'm getting ready for my dissertation process, and I would really like to utilize your tool. I don't even think, and I know that there's a big time change difference across, you know, the ocean, but... I had an immediate response from him and he literally was like, absolutely, you have free access to use whatever. He sent me all the versions, PDF, Word, scoring sheets, you know, all the different subscales and how to calculate them. And then also shared a folder of every publication related to the self-reflection and insight scale. So I literally had a big part of my literature review sent to me by the creator of the SRIS. And so that was absolutely great. And from there, it just kind of took off. Like, okay, what, what do we know about reflection? What's the importance of it? And, you know, going and, deep, and diving deeper and just literally, I think, doing searches every day to build my literature review folder. Yeah, I had a similar uh, experience. I used the teaching perspective inventory for part of my uh, study. And the tough part there was we had some questions on the data that they had been collecting through the many years. And the creator of the uh, the scale had actually passed away, so it, you know it was oh. really hard to get the information and the data I was looking for because his partner, who had been running it and kind of taking it over, didn't know a lot of the backstory. He was just kind of picking up in the middle and was like, "I don't know. This is what he had. Does this help you any?" And I was like, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> so that, that was definitely an interesting uh, a twist in things, but. So you, you've got your idea now, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about writing your proposal in the Institutional Review Board or the IRB as we referred to it earlier um, and that process, what that kind of looks like? 
Um, absolutely. Um, the first part of the writing proposal requires, like, so knowing that there was that doctoral proposal um, course that was going to assist me along this, um, that was embedded in the curriculum, requires you to find committee members. And so the chair had to be a faculty from the University of Indianapolis. That's where I did my program. And so that was easy. My DHSC program director was like, absolutely, I've got the perfect person with you. It's actually the program director for the entry level DPT program, Sarah Schultz, which was great. Um, and so we started communicating via email. Um, we had never met in person, but thankfully, as during the doctoral proposal process, ELC happened, and we were both at ELC. And so we actually got to have coffee and really talk about things, which was great to meet her face to face because everything else previously had been electronic communication because it's a hybrid program. Um, and then I needed a statistical analysis expert. Um, and so that was also pretty easy going. I had been working with a faculty member in pharmacy at the institution that I was at, who I knew would be an awesome choice. He ran everybody's stats for almost everybody in health sciences, um, had done his PhD in pharmacoeconomics from UNC Charlotte that was both mixed methodology. So both um, quantitative and qualitative just a really great giving guy. And I was like, okay. And he's one of the movers and shakers. So I was like, okay, if my staff guy is a mover and shaker, we can get this done as well. So at that point, the content expert on the other hand took me a little bit. I had sent some emails out to some of my contacts thinking, okay, who is an expert in the field on reflection? And so, you know, I had, or educational research, either one, um, because I think it would fit the best. And so I had sent an email to a couple of my colleagues and some of them were like, you know, I've done educational research and I've done, you know, but my strong suit is more pedagogy, not reflection. Or my area of content is IPE, um, not exactly what you're looking for. And so one of those emails landed me um, from a colleague at KU Med, who's the program director there, um, of the entry level DPT. And he literally was like, Becky, I love your idea. It's I really don't have the expertise to help you out, but you know who you should contact is Gail Jensen at Creighton. And I was like, Steve, I can't just like, I don't know her. Like I've never met her. I'm not sure about that. And he was like, listen, you're going to be fine. Send her an email, tell her I referred you. Um, and then I thought she would be a good match. And so I literally cold emailed um, Gail Jensen and she responded immediately was like, I'm excited and interested. Let's set up a phone call. And so I think we were talking in that same week. Um, and she vetted me to make sure that I was, you know, going to stay on track and not somebody who was going to be wandering and it wasn't going to take multiple, multiple years and, and, and different things. And she even said to me, she's like, I think I can tell that you've got your stuff together and that this isn't going to be something that's long and drawn out. So absolutely, I will go ahead and sit on your committee. And it was even within that first phone call where as I was talking through my frameworks and what I had come up with that she literally referenced three articles from medical teacher on a um, theor theoretical framework called the master adaptive learner. And she was like, this is what you're trying to do. And this is the topic and you need to. And she was like rambling off and setting off, you know, um, different articles and things in their years. And so I grabbed those articles, getting off the phone with her. And it literally was that missing link of what I was looking for. It was the basis of foundation of the theoretical framework that really supported what I was actually going to do for my educational intervention. Um, I think after all that, things got, you know, pretty easy for a little bit, but then I kind of struggled a little bit with the um, chapter three, which is the methodology chapter. Um, there was a lot of revisions back and forth to make sure that it would be okay from the IRB approval side of things. And so my statistical um, guy, as well as the one of the instructors in the program who teaches stats, really helped me kind of go back and forth. And so once we had that, knowing it was going to be a short turnaround, I was very proactive in making sure that people knew my timelines and contacting the IRB chair to let them know that it would be coming and when was the last possible date before Christmas break in order and what was the typical turnaround and things like that. Um, and so the IRB process was actually not that terrible because I went through such a rigorous feedback back and forth with my committee. So once it was all set, I had the one, like I talked about, the one edit of changing the check the box on the survey to make sure that it was truly anonymous for the IP. But otherwise, they took everything as was and it was accepted. Wow, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot to process there. And I, I kind of just want to 
touch on a few points. One, uh, Gail Jensen's been on the show several times and we just love her. She's a Macmillan lecturer, uh, award winner. She's just, you know, Gail is, is one of the pinnacles of, uh, of educational research and, and expertise and, you know, can't say enough good things about her. You really uh, hit the gold mine with, with Gail uh, being on your committee. But speaking to that, I think it's very important that people take time to put together their committee. I don't think people realize how important that committee is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would not have gotten through my process without my committee. Uh, they just dragged me across the finish line, kicking and screaming half the time. Um, but yeah, the, your committee is very, very important. So uh, definitely a point to, to, you know, just put a check mark next to it and a gold star and realize that uh, picking your committee is a very important process. So, so don't overlook that. I absolutely would agree. And I think that knowing, you know, the turnaround, what are the expectation times? Like my statistical content expert had stuff back to me, I think in less than 24 hours. Yeah, He's just amazing. one of those movers and a shaker. So for me, that was fantastic. Um, and then I gave, you know, the, the ultimate goal was like a two week window and it was, it was seamless. Um, and the information and the edits that they gave back to me were so rich um, of really having me go deeper into the process and really think about all angles and all aspects of things. So I could not have done it without my committee. And the fact that, you know, Gail took a call from some random person she didn't know and was willing to give her time and her expertise and her knowledge was, you know, absolutely amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't say enough good things about my committee and, and I had people add to the committee a little bit later on. They didn't actually come on, but they helped me with bits and pieces and holes that I had because I started out as an English major and I just thought I was going to be a pretty good writer. This will be no problem. And scientific writing is a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. um, and they literally turned me from like an English writer to a scientific writer. And that, that took, that was a process. So Mm -hmm. kudos to them for uh for sculpting <laughs> me into something i wasn't for sure yeah um so next comes the research and implementation process right the data collection uh what was that like for you um i think this was the most exciting part for me um checking the box in chapters one two and three because i had chosen educational research my intervention was in the classroom of a course i was already going to be teaching but had changed the methodology to be intentional in order to foster improved self-reflective ability in DPT students. And it was during a um, adult neuro management course um, that I taught right before they were going on a clinical rotation. So best time to think about what the importance of self-reflection is on their performance. And so all of my subjects were readily available. Um, they were right sitting in front of me um, and participated obviously um, voluntarily in a pre or post course survey um, along with intentional guided reflective clinical reasoning practices. And so from start to finish, my data collection was complete in eight weeks. And it ultimately, like, I think that was the best thing because it, it, I was able to, because I had all the pre-survey data, which was actually looking at their self-reflection and insight scale, but then it's correlations and relationships to other non-cognitive traits of metacognition. So we looked at self, um, coping self-efficacy, we looked at grit, and then we looked at emotional intelligence. And what relationships did those three constructs have to the ability to self-reflect? And so I actually was able to start my data analysis and running my correlations and my um, multiple regression early. So I was able to do that even before my, my post-survey results. And so I had a lot of that done. So when the eight weeks came around, um, I was able to then just run the pre and the post comparison. So I was, that was, I'm trying to think, mid-March, and then I actually got everything together, put the pedal to the metal and wrote and was able to defend um, in mid-April. So I finished up those chapters four and five and defended. Um, my program had no idea what to do with me. <laughs> they, they had never had this situation where somebody had gone through, you know, I think one person prior to me and it was because her job was riding on it. She had to complete it and it was before the cohort style. So she just went crazy and plowed through. Um, but they were like, we, okay, like you're, this is great. You want to go ahead and defend. So actually, um, typical, they give the time frame for those dissertation, like that doctoral project dissertation credits to go um, through the summer and then through December. And I was able to actually graduate this May. So. 
Yeah, I was going to say, uh, this is not normal, not for, normal. for most people. You so may have asked the wrong person to be on the show. I know, right? Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll even us out, I promise. Because like I said, uh, you know, I took one semester off for family issues, and then I took another semester, not off, but um, I had to redo a semester too. So I, I extended four semesters and made it six. So um, believe me, it is not, it is not a, that normally that smooth of a process. Uh, <laughs> It, you know, we just happened to interview brilliant minds on the show. So I don't know. <laughs> for, people, uh, for people that are, are into, you know, dissertations and thinking about the process, uh, just realize it is a process. It's, uh, you know, five chapters of, of a lot of blood, sweat and tears and, and it's hard work, but uh, definitely rewarding at the end. Um, you know, a, a huge sense of accomplishment for sure. And, you know, something that now looking back, I think it, it did make sense to do for me. And it, it, it is something that's going to work out, even though I'm not terribly sure what I want to do yet. I do have some, some opportunities that have opened to me that I never would have imagined. Um, so, so far so good, uh, but we're still early on in the process. Um, mm -hmm. Becky, if you wouldn't mind, would you talk a little bit about the writing process and, and really more so the editing process? Because I know I had to edit mine I can't even count how many times I just went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And there were pretty minute edits that needed to be done all the way right up till submission time. So what, what was that like for you, the writing and the editing? Yeah, it was definitely challenging. Like I said, I um, needed the most assistance probably from methodology standpoint in chapter three. Um, but I truly, I think our program that, or my program that I was in, like because we had practiced academic writing from day one in the program, through everything that they did throughout the, the process in the cohort, we were actually working on. I remember taking research, um, I'm trying to think, I think it was called research methods, and the book was research design. And we actually had to perform a full literature review and then write like, so we were, as, as if we were writing chapter two. So we had to do that earlier on, and then we got feedback, and you could submit drafts, and you get feedback. So the way that my program was structured, even with all of our big projects, we did a huge curricular design and assessment project, but they allowed you to submit drafts of each section to gain feedback. So then you were actually getting mentorship in your academic writing before you turned in the final product. And I think that was done intentionally, but I also think that really truly contributed to me developing my academic writing skills throughout the program. So it wasn't this big struggle towards the end. Um, and you know, my committee was great about returning edits and fostering. And, you know, even after I did my final defense, you know, Gail was like, well, I, you need to add this one reference and you need to change this. And I was still doing edits to the finish line, just like you said. Um, and so, you know, making sure all that was done and then submitting and things like that. So there definitely was a lot of little nuances of verbiage and, and, and ways to present the information that just was such a learning process, and I think it's already made me better. I wrote two abstracts for CSM today, and I remember two years ago when I wrote my first abstract for CSM, it took me, I think, two plus weeks, and then I went out for edits, and then it came back, <laughs> you know, just an abstract if we think about it. But now going through this process, like, I wrote each one in probably about two hours today, so, and not two hours, and I was like, you know, you sit back and you reflect, and you're like, oh my gosh, I had two in a day. This is great, you know. Um, so what the skills that you gain from your terminal program is absolutely, um, you know, I was able to utilize it immediately throughout my career. And now it's just seamless of what it's prepared me to do. Yeah, I, I have never been through a process that is literally dotting the I's and crossing the T's so much. Uh, like you said, there were references that had to be added and and you know things that needed to be changed and and that for me went right up through you know submission time um but let's talk a little bit about that right so you've, you've got your final edit you're done right you've got approval from your committee now you're done right no no you still got to defend this thesis which you've just spent months and months writing and and have gotten approval from it is done it is complete and now you have to defend it so talk a little bit about the defense of your thesis. How did that go? Yeah, so for, because of the hybrid program, I actually was able, when I defended my proposal before I started data collection, that was done via Zoom. Um, so that was actually a little bit, I wanna say less threatening in some ways, but the, the final defense has to be done in person. And so 
headed out um, to UND and I was, it was slightly nerve wracking, um, but thankfully I had a really great colleague um, and dear friend here at my institution that I'm at now. And he literally was like, okay, I want you to practice. And like sent me an email. Um, it was like, here's the invitation to practice. And I was like, okay, that's gonna be great. And so first time I practiced with him, it was like a crash and burn. Like I thought I knew my information. I had been living, eating and breathing it for eight months. I thought this won't be a problem. But then getting into that scenario, knowing you only have, like I had 30 minutes um, and then 30 minutes for questions. So it was, it was for a total hour. And to try to be concise enough yet clear enough to get the, the everything across was definitely a challenge. So we practiced once, kind of crash and burn. Second time, another colleague, um, very well-known researcher um, who has sat on multiple committees, popped in, my original guy. And then there was a student studying in the room. And we were like, hey, you know, you can you can go. And she's like, I'd like to hear it. And I was like, oh gosh, I don't know if that made it worse or better that I had one of my students, you know, <laughs> listen to me actually present. After yeah, that's pressure, right? My dissertation. I'm like, okay, well, this is good, you know. And so I was able to um, go through it a second time, and it went much better. But it really helped me catch some of the like not clear pictures of my results. So then I went back and I totally flipped the order of how I was gonna present my results with pre and post first rather than correlations because it would actually guided the questions to be things I couldn't answer. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm literally, you know, a week out and I'm making changes on my final presentation. Like that was a little bit nerve wracking. And so came home, got it all arranged. And then I literally hooked up my computer to our 70 inch big screen TV in the living room hubby sat down and my three kids and I presented to an audience who had no idea what I was talking about, right? Like none of them lived the PT world and um, that went well. And so cutest thing in the world, my 10 year old at the end was like, so mom, why did you choose reflection? And so, <laughs> you know, I actually got to, you know, answer that question as well. So it was, it was super fun. Um, but because I had lived, eaten, breathed the topic and I knew things so well, um, I really felt like that was helpful too. So I had definitely, I have one of those photographic memories where I can say, oh, this study showed this and this, that, but it was truly synthesizing things to get it across in a very clear, organized manner that I probably struggled the most with from the oral presentation standpoint. Yeah, so uh, my program was a little bit different and because most of it was online, we were actually able to do the final defense via Zoom because oh, wow. my committee was spread from West Coast to East Coast. So <laughs> timing wise, it would have been a disaster to try to get everybody in one place at one time. So uh, that was kind of neat. However, uh, still very nerve wracking. And I think, you know, realistically, I almost think that that was the most nerve wracking thing I've done up till that point. I mean, the oral qualifications was no big deal. Um, you know, the, the writing portion and the IRB stuff was tough. Getting approval from my committee was great, but then, yeah, the defense was really, really nerve wracking. Same thing about 30 minutes and then 30 minutes for questions. Um, you know, had a handful of people sit in on it that were just there along the way uh, to help out and, I had seen the the topic and what I was working on with service-based learning, but I think one of the main topics and main aspects that I thought about and that was taught to me when defending is that you really are the expert in that moment on that topic. Nobody there knows better than you, probably. You know, I mean, there's there's some people that that might know a good deal about what you're talking about, but not your topic specifically. So you are literally there to profess your knowledge and, and defend your thesis and you are the expert in that moment. Um, and that kind of, you know, put me at ease a little bit to think about, yeah, I, I do know this better than most people in this room right now on this conference call here. So here we go. Here's what I know. Yeah, so <laughs> I know I had all my committee members and then anybody else who wanted that was in the program that wanted to watch the process, they could zoom in. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, my committee chair and then all the instructors from UND were in person. So, yeah, I had a little bit of both. So there was definitely, you know, some of that as well as far as, you know, the communication piece. So. All right. So, Becky, you finished your, your uh, thesis. You've defended now successfully. 
what comes next? Do you go find a job or do they come looking for you or do you climb into an abyss and never discuss this awful process again? What, what happens after you finished your, your thesis here? Uh, like I said, I was blessed um, to be able to solid, or, you know, secure an entry level PT job since 2015 um, in an academic institution or a program. And so the DHSC at UND was a formal mentorship program that truly gave me exactly what I needed to be to be a better educator and researcher. Um, and so in that being said, um, recruitment and I have to say the solicitations for jobs when um, I think I post on LinkedIn that I was actually in a terminal academic degree program and even just the day I posted that I was actually enrolled and with the estimated date of completion, I started getting contacts from headhunters because of the you know faculty shortage we've currently got and then the CAPI standards. And so I'm actually about to change faculty positions. Um, and so I am leaving Wingate University and moving to the University of Missouri, um, where I will be teaching there beginning June 1st, so just a couple weeks. Um, and so since graduating, um, you know, those solicitations, those types of things have come in. And that wasn't the case with the University of Missouri. I have had a long-term standing relationship with their faculty. I used to take their students when I was in the clinic when we lived in Kansas City. And I just always knew, you know, I had an opportunity to apply previously and it just didn't work out for timing. And then it came back around full circle and absolutely love all of their faculty. Their program does things just a little bit differently. And I always knew that because their students were different. Um, and then after, you know, they had, I got an email that said, hey, we're getting ready to post our neuro position. Would you be interested? You know, would you consider, I know you haven't been too long in North Carolina, but would you consider moving back to Missouri? And I was like, hmm, I want to think about this. Um, you know, and having checked, knowing I was going to check the box on my terminal degree, um, said, you know, it's, it's definitely worth exploring. And I went out and did my interview and sitting with them and talking and, you know, just realizing their purpose, their implicit curriculum, at the end of the day, what their goal was and saying like, yes, just knowing that that was the place that I was supposed to be. So uh, we've got big change coming up. We've, you know, not sold our house here in North Carolina and I'm probably going to go out for a couple months by myself and start my job and, you know, Bill and the kids will follow. But literally, um, yeah, so I don't, I'm not, I am getting a lot of job offers, but I, I have settled on one as far as that goes. Um, and I think that that holds true for most people that are in degree programs. Like I've talked a lot to the people in my cohort and it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of had lot. that. Yeah. <laughs> I, so when I graduated, I was the only EDD that graduated that day. Um, and, and, and so, I was, oh <laughs> yeah, so I was literally the first one on the stage. I crossed the stage and then everybody else after me was a different degree. Uh, you know, most of them were DPTs, OTs, stuff like that. So after the graduation ceremony, I literally had three heads of programs come up to me that day and ask if I was interested in teaching and if I wanted to, you know, join the program. And I was like, well, I just graduated a few hours ago. So I think I'm going to take my time and, and figure it out. Um, but yeah, there, there are opportunities out there for sure, it sounds like. And, and with the CAPI recommendations of, you know, 50% terminal degrees I, and more and more programs we're launching every year, I, we're, we're definitely in a shortage, I, I would say. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but I know it's, it's, it's pretty tough nowadays to fill out a, a decent core faculty with 50% yeah, terminal absolutely. degrees. I also, um, um, because of all of this and because of just some conversations and people I knew, I actually now have that opportunity to help, like, form some terminally academic degree graduates through the Selling College DSC program. So I'm actually doing some adjunct teaching with them now as well in curriculum design and development um, because of my degree. So I think that's a nice little adjunct side gig as well, but it allows me to contribute to the future of PT educators as well. Yeah, for sure. We've talked about it a lot on this show and how, you know, there's just not a great way to transition from a DPT to a terminal degree yet. And we're going to need a lot of help figuring that out in the future if CAPD wants to continue with, with the recommendations that they have of 50%, um, you know, or, or just in general, if, if DPTs want to go on and get a terminal degree, we need to find better ways to, to help them with that. So, I think Belling College is definitely doing some great things. Um, a lot of the two-year DPT programs uh, are doing some good things. I know we just had uh, two students on um, 
from Texas Women's University down in Houston there. And they have a neat little bridge PhD program. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of cool programs out there, but there needs to be more than just a couple. Uh, I think we're, we're hurting right now. So it'll be cool to see what the next few years brings as far as opportunity for DPTs looking for a terminal degree. Um, one of the things I wanted to go back and talk about a little bit is, um, if you wouldn't mind, talk about the interview process a little bit. So, you know, you, you've got this terminal degree, you're out there now and schools are, are pulling at you every which way. What does an interview look like for somebody who's just kind of, you know, graduated and looking for teaching positions? Um, so that's, that's a great question because I think based on each institution, it's a little bit different. Um, so, you know, when I came out to Wingate to interview, it was a day long process and you are told, you know, here's your schedule, but you also have to prepare a presentation and give a formal presentation. And that presentation could be on your teaching and learning philosophies. It could be on a topic that they know that you're looking at teaching in, you know, what the needs are for the program for entry level students. And so um, it was different at Wingate when I interviewed because I actually delivered a topic that I would be teaching an entry level PT. And, but the, all the faculty were there to observe it as well as students. So students were able to weigh in um, and had a little survey and they got you know, information and, and, and reviews from them as well too. And then meeting one-on-one -on -one, um, or in small groups of faculty is how it was at Wingate. And then you, know, you meet the dean and then you, have, you, know, you meet with HR and it's a very long grueling. So by the end of the day, it's hard to form sentences um, because you talk to so many people and a lot of the times you answer the same questions multiple times. When I went out to the University of Missouri, similar process and then I met, I came in and then I met with the search committee and answered their questions and then did my presentation. But as part of my presentation, I had to do my topic but then I had to devote 15 minutes on how I would deliver this topic and engage learners in more active learning strategies. So they really wanted to know my pedagogical approaches in the classroom and what I was going to do and that it wasn't, you know, what that was, which I actually appreciated. I was excited to know that because that's one of my philosophies is more of the active learning. You need to get away from passive lecture as we know the science behind it is, is not great. And so um, I was able to do that and I kind of, you know, brought up the, you know, hey, when we're, we're going to do neuro exam, the students have access to physio U, and they have opportunities to learn the neuro exam components and talking about some of the higher level technologies and applications and things and the fact that, you know, the topic was concussion um, as part of the TBI series and that I had a old one, a pa not an old patient, but one of my former patients actually Skype in. And I did his case study and the patient was able to Skype in and it was tele. So it, it literally exposed those first, you know, entry level DPT students to the potential of tele rehab. And so they got to interact with the, the patient and hear his story. And then an IPE event as well with um, physical therapy and athletic training. And so I was able to share all my ideas. And then the, instead of meeting with pockets of faculty or faculty one-on-one, -on -one, this was a little intimidating, but we went into the conference room and every faculty member was there all together. So it was like this round table interview. Um, so, but from doing a couple interviews in higher education, in my experience, I really liked that because I was able to see how the faculty interacted together. You know, were there, was there a lot of over talking? You know, was there only a few people that said things? Did everybody have a voice at the table? What were their questions, those types of things. And right there, it was just so nice to see the inner workings of everybody at the same time, because at the previous um, interview, it was in pockets. They're just a little bit different. I think everybody does things a little bit differently. So. Yeah, for sure. It's just, uh, it's kind of cool to hear the processes that people have gone through and what they've uh, experienced because, uh, you know, especially for somebody like me, I've got this terminal degree. I've done a little bit of adjunct, you know, professorship for Baylor. Um, and that's been neat, but I've never applied for a full-time faculty position. So I don't, you know, I don't even know lo what to look forward to. I remember my first application and they said CV, right? <laughs> Curriculum Vitae. And I was like, okay, I have a resume. How do I get this into like the CV format with the caffeine? And, you know, this was back in 2015 mm -hmm. and it was, it's a steep learning curve. Going yeah. to higher um, education, they do things very differently. 
Um, there's a lot more processes, um, vetting as well as politics. So that could be a whole nother conversation. <laughs> right, right. And, and one of the reasons that I've been so reluctant and, and hesitant to go into academia is the politics. Um, but, you know, I've been put at ease from a lot of um, mentors and a lot of people that it's just about finding your right fit and yep. finding, you know, the best fit for you. It's out there. You just have to find it. Uh, so, you know, that, that that's kind of good to know that uh, it's, it, it's not about, you know, trying to squid a, uh, or fit a square peg into a round hole. It's a matter of like, you know, you doing your due diligence and talking with people and really networking. I mean, I, I think... Yeah. I think the networking has been more key than anything. I've had opportunities, you know, kind of present themselves to me just because of the people I've known, the people I've had on the, sh you know, we've had on the show, um, you know, opportunities that have come up where they've needed help or needed somebody to fill in, you know, it, it, it's really just about putting yourself out there and seeing, you know, talking to people you respect, talking to your mentors, talking to people who know better and have gone through it. And, and then kind of putting yourself in the right positions at the right time to, to hopefully find a good fit. And it sounds like you've done that exactly. So. Yes. I'm very excited. <laughs> well, Becky, we'd like to ask all of our guests this one final question. If you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or DHSC or otherwise related, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Um, this is, you know, I listen to all the answers because I'm an avid listener of the podcast. Um, and you, there's definitely, if you think qualitatively, there's some themes out there, um, which would be interesting. But I think the biggest aha moment for me after completing my terminal degree and then, you know, pairing it with the Center of Excellence, the National Center of Excellence Studies that Jensen um, and her colleagues have done, Part 1 and Part 2 for reform. And I think what really came out of that is we do not have enough faculty trained in the science of teaching and learning. Um, you know, we need our foundational scientists to teach our anatomies and our pathophysiologies and our physiologies and things. And we definitely need that. Um, and we definitely need our clinical faculty to be able to relate it to what is happening in the current field, right? And teaching all of that. But the whole science of teaching and learning, I can think back to my first course I ever taught as full-time faculty, and God bless those students, I can't believe they actually learned something, because I did, you know, after going through my terminal academic degree program, I think, oh my gosh, I can't believe they even, like, passed their boards, you know, what was I thinking, but you just don't know it. Um, and so having that true training in science and teaching and learning, and not everybody needs to have that, but at least some people on faculty, um, that help with curricular design and curricular revision and things that can do some mentorship. Um, and I think it's all about partnerships. It's partnership between terminal academic, academic degree faculty and, you know, the clinical faculty, those that, you know, are, and, you know, everyone comes from different backgrounds, but if, you know, they choose that they're not going to get the terminal degree, which is absolutely fine, we still need those clinical faculty. And it's the partnership and the pairing between that can help out um, and that mentorship that is the biggest thing for the future of, of physical therapy and breaking down those walls. Yeah, you, you hit on a very deep and rich topic there that has a lot of layers to it because we've, we've had uh, Chad Cook on the show before and he was uh, saying that he loves the EDD for curriculum development and things like that, like you were talking about. So um, that made me feel pretty good. Like, Hey, you know, yeah, we, we, we can bring value. You know, we, we, we look at things differently. We learned how to learn and how to teach. Um, and not everybody needs to do that. But then, then there's the other elephant in the room. Well, how do we bridge the gap from the, you know, the tower of, of academia into the clinical? And I think, you know, exactly what you said, there has to be a level of respect. There has to be a level of partnership and, you know, collaboration when it comes to teaching, research, and clinical work. And so... You know, I, I think we're working that out now. I think we're finally realizing that we all got to be in the sandbox at the same time, having the same discussions and helping each other out with strengths and weaknesses. And that's going to result in the best possible outcome for students. So I think we're getting there, uh, but I think we still got a long way to go. And I think that's part of the reason that, you know, this podcast exists is because, you know, we knew it wasn't great. Uh, but we didn't know the answer. So we figured let's just have all the experts on and they'll talk about the answers and, and hopefully we can figure it out at some point. Right. So, absolutely. So no, I couldn't agree more. Well, Becky, thank you so much for your time and for coming on the show tonight. Where can people reach out to you online or on social media if they have any follow-up questions or just want to chat? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, I teach national CEUs on the sport related concussion too. So I have um, a definitely a very large professional Twitter account. Um, so that Twitter handle um, is at BBLISSDPT. Um, so you can reach me there or by email. Um, so I can give you my email um, for the show notes or on the website to link to. Um, just because of the transition between the positions, like it will be my personal email, but that's absolutely fine to reach out to. All right, great. Yeah, we'll put all those in the show notes for all of those listening. Again, Becky, thank you so much for your time and for coming on tonight. Can't wait to see what's in the future for you. Thanks so much. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.